um, well, it's an extra one in August um, for uh, to celebrate and talk through the month one of our ICS. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by John McDonald and Dr Chris Clayton, um, who will be talking us through this presentation today. Uh, just as ever, we're just going to go through a few of the formalities. Um, so there are a large number of people at this meeting today. We are expecting uh, about 100 people to this. Um, so we do ask that everybody turns their microphones off while the presenters are going through the presentation, just so there's no background noise, that kind of thing. We also ask if possible if cameras can be turned off as well so that um, the cameras are, are focused on our interpreter and on our speakers who are spotlit. Uh, if you can put any questions in the chat box, we will come back to them at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll answer as many of those questions as we can um, at the end of the presentation and any that are unanswered will take offline and we'll email out to everyone uh, the answers. This session is being recorded uh, and will be posted on YouTube. The link will be circulated to everyone who's attended and it's also available on our online engagement platform. If you do have a question at the end of the session um, and we will invite you to raise your hand, you do that by using your reactions button. It's either a little hand just here on the screen or it is a smiley face with a hand in front of it. If you click on that, you should see the hand to raise. So without further ado, um, I shall introduce you to John McDonald, who is the chair of NHS Derby and Derbyshire Integrated Care Board, and Dr Chris Clayton, who's our chief executive, um, to go through today's session. Thank you very much, Lenny. So, so my name is John McDonald, as Lenny said, and I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to say a few brief words about the integrated care system, the integrated care uh, board and the integrated care partnership. And later on, I'll, for those who are familiar with the difference between those, um, I'll, I'll say a few words on that. But if I could just have the first slide, thanks. So that's what we're briefly going to cover between Chris and I. So I'll say a few words and then Chris is going to come and give you quite a lot more detail later on. Um, and this is a very early stage. We've been work, we've been legally established for just over a month now. So it's in its early days, but this is really quite an important change in, in the way the NHS runs and in, term, in terms of how it works with a wide range of partners uh, from the public sector, local authorities, et cetera, voluntary sector uh, and others, which we'll talk a bit about as well. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing is, is what, um, you know, how we're going to work together. And what this really talks about very much is, I think, the purpose of what the integrated care system is trying to do. And it is different to, it's wider than um, prior to this, in the sense that, yes, we are very much uh, engaged with how we deliver care, but also how we're integrating care much more, so that the organisations providing care will be working much more closely with the, together in a strong um, partnership and collaboration. And that's aimed very much at making uh, the care that people provide easier to navigate around, uh, make sure that we're making all the links that the different organisations and staff are talking to each other. The second thing I think is that um, it's very much focused on not just treatment, and I'll come on to this a bit more later, but also on the much wider determinants of health. And they're listed there in, in the last dot point there. And uh, Chris, I know we'll say a bit more of this, but only about 20% of your health relates to the treatment you receive in from the health service. The rest of it is actually your lifestyle. And, and Chris, as I said, will go into that. But that's really quite a quite a um, important statistic. Um, the third thing is that we the way we work means a big in change in the culture. We've had 20, 25 years now of working in a, a semi-market way where we're contracting and competing. Um, and now it's all about collaboration and partnership. And that's quite a big change, but it's one I think many people in the NHS really welcome. Our next, next uh, slide, please. Thank you. 
So the integrated care boards have replaced the clinical commissioning groups from the beginning of July, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the CCGs, very much commissioning um, organisations. Uh, and as I said before, we've, the ICB has a wider remit, but it is also a, got the commissioning role, and that's absolutely critical. And indeed, um, some services which have been commissioned at a regional level will in the future be commissioned at a, a local level through the ICBs. I've talked about the working together, the local authority and voluntary sector, and indeed the universities, uh, parts of the private sector, are uh, much closer with communities. We have been doing that for a while. This change isn't a sort of overnight change. And I think that the history of system collaboration working does put us in good, good stead. And the other thing to note is that uh, Glossop, which previously wasn't within the Derbyshire system, uh, is now part of the Derby and Derbyshire healthcare system. And the main reason for that is to give us um, a common boundary with the local authorities, the city and the county. Um, and, and that's the reason why Glossop has now become part of the Derbyshire system. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, could I have the next slide? Thanks. I said earlier that I was going to talk about the ICS, the ICB and the ICP. So the ICS is the large system which works together in, in collaboration and partnership. It includes local authorities, it includes the NHS, uh, it includes social care, obviously critical in that, and um, public health. It includes the voluntary sector um, who are really important in terms of providing local services. And so it's a partnership of different organisations. But there are two statutory elements of that. The first, um, if I might, is to jump to the ICP. This is the statutory committee which oversees the ICS. But in saying that, it needs to work in very close collaboration with the Health and Wellbeing Board. All these things are like a big Venn diagram. They've got bits that they're responsible for, but there's quite big important elements of overlap. And so the ICP doesn't take away the um, responsibility of the Health and Wellbeing Board to look at a much wider um, improving health, health of the population, and to develop strategies for that. But it does focus very much on the integrated care, on prevention, on trying to get upstream from the way that services have, current, have previously been provided. And the ICB is both an organisation and a statutory board. And its role is primarily around providing integrated services. But in doing that, it cannot, the NHS can't work in isolation. So social care and some of the voluntary services are particularly important in how we provide services. And the second bit is the NHS needs to think about what its contribution is to health of the population. So are there ways that we can provide services, which means that some people who might have found it difficult to access care have better access to care? We employ a lot of people, we spend a lot of money. Are there ways that in working with local authorities and working with the private sector, we can make sure that we're impacting on employment, on pollution and some of these areas? So there are some wider questions about where we don't lead, but where we're an important partner. So the ICB has a role in that wider agenda, but its primary purpose is on delivering integrated care services. Next. So if you understand that, that's great. Give me a call and explain it to me because we're still trying to work out the boundaries and the overlaps of it all. But but in essence, uh, I've, I've tried to explain it there. Um, next slide, please. So this is really just the, the transition. It talks about, I think, many of the points I've also raised. Um, actually, that's the previous slide, I think. But anyway, um, so can we move on? Not one, but two. Yeah, this is the last one. Thanks very much. And, and I'm not going to talk through these, but you will see that the difference between the CCG and the ICB, um, the ICB has a wider membership than the CCG. Um, there's much more collaboration in the way it plans and um, commissions its service. And it does represent the whole of the NHS, whereas the CCG was more a partner uh, with other NHS organisations. And finally, and I'm repeating myself a bit here, but this is really important. The role of the NHS alongside other partners in tackling health inequalities 
and improving the health of the population means that we have to look at a much wider remit for the NHS. So that's a sort of summary of the differences between them. Um, I went through that reasonably quickly. There's a lot of detail under that, and Chris, I'm sure, will be picking up some of these things. But that's tr what I try to do there is give you a flavour for the differences and a flavour for what we're going to be trying to do differently and how we're going to work differently in the coming year. So, so thank you very much. If I can hand over to Chris, that would be great. Uh, thanks, John. Um, thanks, Laddie, um, for controlling the slides. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat box as we go as well. And um, if I see questions coming in, I'll, I'll pull them in at, at relevant moments. Um, I've done a couple of these sessions um, before, and what I'm about to say probably builds on what we've said before. So please don't be alarmed if, if you know, if this is new to you or indeed if if if, if it's more familiar. We'll, we'll keep going around these points because they are material. They are about, you know, uh, you know, centering on what 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 we're trying to achieve uh, through the integrated care system. The last time I spoke, I mentioned uh, the challenges uh, that we face, and I'm just going to go uh, through them now because they they really underpin what we're trying to achieve through the integrated care system and uh, the integrated care board of the NHS. So if I could just have the next slide, uh, please, Lenny, I'd be grateful. So this is where I start from. So the first um, main objective of the integrated care board, the NHS for Derby and Derbyshire, and indeed the partnership um, that, that surrounds the integrated care partnership, the integrated care system, as John was just explaining, is about improving overall outcomes for the residents and the population of Derby and Derbyshire. That's what we're about. That's what the, the point of all this is. Uh, in fairness, that's been uh, a sort of constant point of, of different iterations of, of the NHS because we all want to improve outcomes. But this slide is absolutely key because if you look at this, and I always refer to it as Dean's slide in, in sort of recognition of, of Dean Wallace, former Director of Public Health for Derbyshire County Council, this sets out um, the position that all of us, doesn't matter what your walk of life is, um, all of the things that um, determine our overall health outcomes. So how long we live for, uh, the quality of that uh, health during the course of our life is determined by these things on this slide. And as John sets out the sort of purple, couple of purple boxes that you see underneath the clinical care is, is what we believe based on the best evidence is, is related to the the benefits of health and social care. And you'll see it's split into two 10 percent. So it's it's access to um, care itself. So if, if you've got a health problem and you you need access for care, having that access and, and the type of that access is important, contributes about 10 percent to your overall outcome. But then if you think about the quality of that care that you receive, that contributes another 10 percent. Now, this is again, it's ba based on international be best evidence. Now, if you've got a medi an immediate health issue, um, you know, if, if you're unfortunate enough to have a, you know, be suffering from a heart attack or a stroke, for example, I know that's extreme, but in that moment, then access to really good clinical care is, is immediately important to you. But if you take the course of your life and take a longer term view, which is what this is doing, actually the contributions of these different elements is what makes up the total 100 percent. And you, as you can see, if we move left to right, as I as I see the slide, you'll see things like health behaviours, you know, how we look after ourselves, the amount of you know, exercise we, we undertake, how good our diet is and whether we smoke or not or are affected by smoke or not, it contributes a significant uh, amount more than actual uh, clinical care as you see it. 
Um, if you look at sort of moving left to right, if you look at the socioeconomic uh, nature of, of of how and where and we live and who, you know who who we interact with, you'll see the importance of education, employment, income, families, uh, social support, networks, and the the safety of the communities that we live in contributes a, an enormous amount to our overall well-being. And then if I jump to the to the the furthest right of the um, slide, you'll see where where we live, that that built environment around us is, is very important, um, not just the sort of quality of that environment, but the the sort of infrastructure that's there. And as you can see, you know, from that slide, the importance of environment factors um, that we're becoming much more aware of and conscious of, um, particularly as we've we've been through uh, recent heat waves and and, and uh, seen changes to to our environment. So hopefully that that makes sense as to what we're focused on as as an integrated care system in terms of how do we improve the overall outcomes for the population. And by looking at this slide, you'll see that if we just focus on the boxes in purple, we're going to miss a huge amount and we're going to continue uh, to be challenged on, on overall outcomes. So I hope that's that's helpful. And if I could, Lenny, please have the next slide. It starts to take us a bit further on from there. So you're going to hear me and you often will hear me talk about two things. Uh, life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Now, colleagues like Dean and Robin from City Council do this better than I do, but but this is my my version of it. And broadly speaking, um, you can see uh, that there are two things that we we consider two two measures. The first one, as you imagine, is how long we live for. That's our life expectancy. And the second measure is the amount of life we have in that total that's in good health, what we call healthy life expectancy. And you'll see from um, this, this slide in front of you, and again, it's courtesy of our county council colleagues in, in the public health department, you'll see that the figures are different for males and females, they are different. And you'll see that there's a difference in um, the healthy life expectancy and life expectancy. And, and this is the area we want to really, really focus on. Because it isn't about simply extending life, it's about improving the quality and, and the health in that in that life period. In other words, that healthy life expectancy. And it's about reducing that gap in the middle between those two. So the uh, shaded area in either the sort of pink colour at the top for females and the more turquoisey colour as I see it um, for males. It's about improving that that life healthy life expectancy so that actually we we all of us uh, live longer in, in good health. And hopefully ho hopefully I've done justice to, to explaining uh, the importance of it uh, to you. And if I could please, uh, Lenny, have the next slide, I'd be grateful. So there are a few things that we're already working on together, whether that be through the integrated care board of the NHS, bringing the NHS family uh, together, or whether that be through a broader partnership between the NHS and local authorities and other partners through the integrated care system, um, the ICS. And in terms of the um, three things that I like to talk about, and the three things that we're focusing on, um, these, are, these are they. So as you've seen, there's something that I call a health gap. So in terms of the health of the overall population, uh, you'll know and you'll have seen in the statistics, that the, the overall health of the population isn't improving. Uh, we've got some real challenges with outcomes for uh, people's health. And uh, 
um, you've seen in some parts of, of the country that overall improvements in what I've just been describing in terms of life expectancy and health at life expectancy have, have started to stall and in some parts of the country started to, to, to reverse and go backwards. That's important to us because it, it's, it, it's a driver for everything else. And we continue to focus on uh, the causes of that and, and working together to, to improve it. But as you can imagine, if, if the health of the population isn't where we'd like it to be together, um, then obviously there are going to be an increasing amount of care requirements in, in response to that. You've just seen, haven't you, on the, the slide, what I refer to as Dean's slide, you've just seen that we're talking about um, the consequences of people's health, overall health, the causes of them, but actually then the requirements for what we call clinical care. And if you imagine the, the health of the population isn't where we want it to be, well, that's going to have a consequent requirement for increased care. And this is where I talk about the care gap. You'll have seen and you'll have seen me report in, in previous um, um, discussions about uh, the challenges the COVID pandemic have brought. And you've seen the increase in waiting times and waiting lists. Well, that's an example of a care gap. There's a care requirement. Um, uh, you know, people require operations, for example, and there's there's a there's a challenge to respond to that and deliver that care, you know, in, 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 a, in a timely way. And, and as such, you get waiting lists and, and what we refer to as backlogs. So and I've got a, a slide about that later on in terms of some of the changes that we've we've seen in, 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 in recent months, actually, on some of the, that data. And then finally, I talk about something called the resource um, gap. So I talk about three types. I talk about people. I talk about pounds, in other words, money, finance, and I talk about properties or estates, you know, in terms of the the architect, the infrastructure of, of the health and care system. And I think it's fair to say we've talked about it before. All all three of those are under challenge and it's it's a cyclical challenge between all of those three. So it's so obviously the more challenged the health gap is, the more challenged the care gap is, and clearly the the more challenged the response is in, and the, the call on our collective resources. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of the three fundamental areas that we were working on together. I'll just pause. Um, I'll just pause briefly just to pick up Peter's question and the um, the thread of, of the, the chat box now before I move on. So when we talk about um, healthy life expectancy, there's a definition that um, we can we can send out formally through Lenny and colleagues afterwards. But there's a definition that our public health colleagues use, and it's it's the point at which we we live without any what we call long term conditions, and there are multiple of those. Before they start to impact on the quality of our, our life. And it's that point at which that changes. Um, now, long term conditions, whether that be things like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Uh, are, are increasing. Um, cancer is, is a really important long term condition now to to talk about. Uh, if we think about the difference that's happened in the last decade or two, where we've turned the curve in that more people now live with cancer uh, than than die directly from it, that that's that's a shift in, in long term conditions. So so the definition we use around healthy life expectancy is that period of time between birth and the point at which uh, your life is not impacted by um, longer term conditions if so hopefully that makes sense but we'll we'll send out um th those definitions for you as, as they're set they're, they're they're set internationally and nationally by our public health experts so hope that's helpful i've, I've picked that question from uh, peter up uh, if i could have the next slide please lenny 
Thank you very much. So, so what we've done in in previous conversations is we've said, look, we're preparing for the uh, health and social care bill. Uh, we talked about the creation of integrated care boards, the, the creation of integrated care partnerships, and we did look quite a lot of build up conversations to that in terms of what we were putting in place. And as, as John set out, the board has gone live. It, it's met now. In, um, formally in public and, and, and so on. It, it obviously met in shadow before as part of the preparation, but 1st of July it, it went live as, as John set out the former clinical commissioning groups were abolished and, and we, we worked through that process. But we thought it was important that we, we regrouped um, straight afterwards uh, the formation to say, well, well, where are we, you know, one month in and, you know, None of us are naive enough to think that in a month you can you can make uh, you know such a significant difference. But um, we did want to just regroup and say, well, these are things we've been working on, and these are things we continue to work on, and you know keep that conversation going and keep it live. So here are a few things. It's been a busy month. I, I'm not going to lie to to you. Um, we've had a few things to contend with and. Clearly, um, we've we've had a heat wave. Um, reports are that the end of this week is going to be particularly warm. And of, of course, we'll be working with our local resilience forum partners on supporting different agencies on that. Uh, if we think um, to the challenges that the, the heat wave poses, both directly and indirectly, um, you, you don't need me to go through them, um, but you've seen You'll have seen in national media some of the challenges that occurred across the country it, with regards to heat wave, but we're we're not excluded from that. We're part of that that national response. We're part of you know feeling feeling the heat for want of a better phrase. And so certainly uh, the NHS and local authorities were, were supporting the broader partnership on on that. And if I could have the next uh, slide, please, Lenny. Thank you. And yes, again, and, and partly in relation to uh, the heat wave, um, Derbyshire did something we we've not done before as an as, as an integrated care system. Not only because obviously the integrated care system um, concept is new, but because we, I mean we have been working in partnership before. But we did something quite extraordinary in um, in July towards the end, and we declared a, a critical incident based on. Uh, the pressures that we were facing across uh, the NHS, particularly in our hospitals, uh, our two uh, major hospitals at Chesterfield and Royal Derby, um, but also the pressures that our ambulance services were facing. And that was a culmination of lots of different factors, but of course uh, the challenges around uh, the weather uh, didn't help that. What that was uh, about was a was focusing the entire system on helping us at that real point of need and you've heard me speak before about uh, the the challenges the care the care demands on the service and uh, th that that in itself is not new to us but at certain times those pressures can increase and you can have particular points of pressure and that's what this critical incident was 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 about it was about a, a particular peak in demand and pressure and it was it, it it through calling it it allowed us to do a few things it allowed us to have a different conversation with members of the public about the pressures in the service it allowed us to uh, really, really prioritise in that moment the types of care that we needed to, as I, as I say, prioritise, you know, and unfortunately that meant, you know, some cancellations of, of routine uh, procedures and operations to support the, the urgent and emergency care requirements. It also allowed us to work in strong collaboration with our local authority partners on what what could we do to improve the the flow of patients through our hospitals so that we could 
uh, keep the doors open at the front to accept new cases. And we work really closely with our other partners to, to support the flow through the hospitals and out of the hospitals and uh, particularly supporting uh, you know, care requirements in the community. We stepped that down a few days later. And as you can imagine, given the sort of extraordinary nature of it, we're looking at that now. Uh, we're doing a process of review uh, to understand what the learning from uh, that incident declaration was and how it will help us going forward. And then if I could have um, the next slide, please, Lenny, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Well, it seems it seems funny, doesn't it? it um, but it, but it really isn't that, it, you know, in the midst of high temperatures and going to getting even warmer towards the weekend, here I am talking about winter. But this is this is where it starts. It starts, um, you know, uh, as soon as we come out of one winter season, we start planning and preparing for the next. It, it really is like that because it has to be. Uh, we have to think about uh, winter readiness and preparation because there's as we all know, there's there are different demands that come because of the winter months. You know, we start to see uh, the circulation of flu and other viruses. Um, we clearly are preparing for a further um, COVID vaccination campaign in the autumn. And we we obviously want to be able to anticipate the types of different care requirements that the the NHS and care system will face and plan for those. Um, but we also want to try and maintain as much as possible a steady state of routine work. And that's why the preparation for winter planning is, is, is so important. As you can imagine, um, we work very closely with NHS England about uh, this system's preparedness and readiness for winter. Uh, because that's part of the national review of uh, the NHS's readiness uh, for, for that time. So as you can imagine it's a really important time for us at the moment in terms of, of, of winter planning. And I think I do have a slide coming up, Lenny, on uh, COVID vaccination. I think I think there's one coming up. If from yes, here it is. Uh, uh, so uh, Derbyshire done a great job in. COVID-19 vaccination. We've worked incredibly hard since the sort of advent of, of, of the, the vaccinations themselves and also the process. We've had different stages and phases of the vaccination program and, and achieved really great things by working in partnership. And the next phase is about to begin or we've got the uh, latest set of guidance from uh, the Joint Committee of Vaccinations and Immunisations. You'll have heard the acronym JCVI. And we're now actively planning what the autumn campaign looks like and who will receive a another booster uh, to the vaccination programme and how that will occur. And the, as you remember from previous waves and, and phases of the programme, we we set out different age groups and worked through them and we're just um, we're just finalizing our plans on on how that is, is to be managed uh, this time but certainly um, uh, the the plans are active they're live and we've got no doubt that we will be wanting to to vaccinate as as many as we can as part of that that program you'll recall that we've had real success in the past uh, in the past iteration of the programme through the vaccination centre. Uh, you'll remember uh, originally the Derby Arena was really important in our in our early model and then the vaccination centre moved uh, to Midland House. Uh, we're currently looking at whether we still require a vaccination centre as such now in the programme or whether we will be able to uh, deliver this in a different way uh, more close to communities in what we call local vaccination services, either through general practices or community pharmacies. And we're just working through and finalising our, our thoughts on those. As you can imagine, we we have times in the vaccination programme where you've got high activity and, and then uh, it, it does tail off. We need to maintain a vaccination approach 
but also you know but you do have these real ramping up of dem of demand for vaccinations as the new waves come come through and i've got no doubt we'll be in a, a similar position on that through through the autumn and into the winter and i think i've got one more slide on the program just in terms of numbers if 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 i remember uh, correctly um thank you so if you could have the next slide please Perfect, thank you. So this just shows uh, what I've just been talking about in terms of the performance on vaccinations. And I talked earlier about um, uh, life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, and the difference between those two and, and the determinants that, that cause that difference. And one of them is around health inequalities. And you remember that what that I referred to as Dean's slide, which showed all the different things that determine people's outcomes. And when you have unequal um, starting points in those across a population, they're, they're termed health inequalities. And you can see on this slide that there is a difference between the vaccination programme uh, and its achievements in the city versus the county of Derbyshire. And you, the figures are, are there, they are genuine figures. And these are the sorts of things that when we run a vaccination programme, we need to consider because the populations are different. They have different needs, they have different approaches to healthcare, they have different ways of accessing healthcare. And so when you're constructing a, a programme like this, you really do need to consider health inequalities as you do. And so um, one of the reasons we, you know, we uh, had a previous uh, vaccination centre in, in in the city was around creating a different type of access uh, for that for you know for that population. Not that there's one population city; it's a, it's a multitude of different populations. But that's that's one of the approaches we took previously, and we're we're considering uh, that actively now. But you can see the difference in in rates. Uh, you'll see on the the figures that the first dose rate is really really important and um oops i think the slide, slides just looked oh it's just gone off my screen that's back again you'll see the first dose rate is is, is really important but it's also now as 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 we go forward the third dose is what we call the booster dose is really important don't be surprised uh in terms of some of the figures there because the cohorts changed we we included far more people in the vaccination program uh, you'll remember that um, not too long ago we opened it up to children and and so that increases the overall population that you're you're trying to achieve if you look at the different age groups in that overall figure that you can see in front of you you'll see that um, there's much different take up in the different age groups. And that's another inequality that we need to work on, uh, the different views of, of, of different age groups around vaccination. So hopefully that's just a helpful bit of insight on, on uh, the programme. Uh, just, just a little plug for the other immunisations we do. We've got the flu programme coming up, uh, you know, starting this autumn. You know, anybody eligible, please, please, please get your flu jab. And uh, obviously we've got other immunisation programmes, particularly in our in our children, uh, really well established, really well supported, really well delivered through our general practice and community programme. So please, you know, let's all get behind vaccination as a, as a key, a key um, part of our army against uh, infectious disease. So if I could just have the next slide, please, Lenny, I think I'm moving to other statistics now about where we are in Derbyshire. I've just been talking about general practice. This is a really important issue, um, uh, you know, in terms of the availability of general practice appointments. And hopefully this slide just puts some facts and figures uh, to it. And it's always um, uh, really astonishing when, when you think about the uh, number of appointments offered every month you know uh, month in month out through our general practice you you see the scale of general practice operating across the county 
you see the size of it. When when you think of general practice, think of the individual surgeries that we have. You, you don't often get the sense of scale, but when you when you multiply those up and bring them together, you see that um, circa half a million appointments every single month and that we've maintained that over the years you'll see actually there's always ups and downs in any given month but you'll see that we've maintained um the uh, numbers of appointments there in in some months you'll see we've gone uh, significantly up in terms of the appointments that we've offered and uh that's uh, sorry let me just admit this person and then you, you'll see that this is a really important focus for us. You, you'll also see the vast majority of those are face to face appointments, uh, really significant um, two thirds, uh, sometimes going up to three quarters face to face. And you'll see something uh, there about um, wasted appointments. And not on it, you know, when you add all those um, appointments that weren't attended, you know, you're into tens of thousands in, in any given month. So again, uh, plug for us all uh, to use use our services wisely and let's just focus on on not wasting appointments and we've all we've all got a role uh, to play in that. So if I could um, just have the next slide, so hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, maintaining our, our access in general practice. I mentioned this concept of of a care gap, and I'm going to probably go into this a little bit now. So one of the areas that I talked about was waiting times, uh, particularly waiting times for operations, and there are there are there's a whole myriad of different types of operations that go on from, you know, really urgent cancer operations at, at one end of the spectrum to more routine operations at, at the other all important uh, to the person who's waiting but obviously um, when you manage a health service you you do need to apply uh, priority in those when you've got challenges in, in terms of, of, of the demands but one of the areas we talk about is this thing called elective care now that's that's a catch-all phrase for types of care that you can plan for it's 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 the opposite to urgent and emergency care so these are the types of things that um you would pop you know see your own doctor about your your gp uh, if you did require specialist treatment that your gp would refer you to a hospital specialist you'd be seen in outpatients and you'd, you'd have a a planned operation if that was what if that's what was deemed to be required and that covers it but it, it, it is a big catch-all there is a lot in what we call elective care in, including um, what we call diagnostic procedures scans MRI scans CT scans and so on uh, as uh, you know as well as other things but in, in this catch-all there's been something we've been focusing on as part of the national uh, NHS plan around elective care and one of them is, is around two year waits. Now, you'll remember um, before the pandemic, Derbyshire eliminated our, our waiting list for people who'd been waiting a year, so one year. And we did that uh, in March, I'd like to say March 2020 from, from memory, having had a, a, a large waiting list before. And obviously the pandemic came and that's affected waiting times and so in recovery from the pandemic uh, clearly we wanted to focus on those that had obviously been waiting the longest and so there was a, a national effort to uh, eliminate those those patients waiting two years or more and you'll see from this slide that we've done an incredible job so in January we we had just under 500 people who had been waiting uh, more than two years. Um, it's been released in the national media today that the NHS as a whole has has succeeded in hitting this target and Derbyshire has been a contributor into that national target. And we have uh, eliminated our uh, waiting list um, uh, 
for those who've been waiting two years. Um, bar six people whose conditions were overly complex and we we you know we couldn't get that done in the time and for three people who who chose uh, to continue to wait so barring those those nine which which are understandable we've done a marvelous job in in moving that uh, forward and and of course i think the next slide talks about if i could go there it talks about the next focus now on on reducing uh, the waiting list further and going um, where we where we talk about people who've been waiting for 78 weeks. And if I could have the next slide, please, then I'd be grateful. And so as you can imagine, we you know, we've started at those waiting the longest at two years and above. We're now working on reducing it down and you'll see the next target for us is by April that we eliminate waits of more than 78 weeks. So you can imagine at any given time in a waiting list, you've got lots of different people who've been waiting different lengths of time, but our focus now will be on getting that waiting list back and recovering that, that position. Um, you know, this is really important and recognize that, you know, within the great, you know, the, the list of everybody who's waiting, there'll be those with really immediately pressing needs, but all of these patients are important. All of these needs is, are important to that individual and um, it's important to us and, and we're systematically working through this for you. If I could just have the next slide, I think I'm coming to the end uh, now, Lenny, and I'll, I'll um, have a quick look in the chat box uh, in a moment. But yes, so we just wanted to finish really, and it's something we do every time, is just uh, reminding uh, you know colleagues about the types of conversations we have so if I could just go straight on to the next slide. Well, this is an example of one particular activity, but it's by no means it. Um, so we have these conversations across uh, the partnership and extended partnerships just to talk about where we're up to. We have other uh, update sessions and engagement and involvement sessions going on with through Team Derbyshire. We've got lots of sort of uh, drop in activity across the patch. We've mentioned gloss up there, but it happens, you know, in other areas. We've got really specific focus conversations going on. We've got the Ashbourne 50 plus group there being talked about. And then, of course, we engage on specific activities, you know, uh, specific health and care needs. We, we mentioned eating disorders there as an example where we we focus down. But also, let's not forget that the integrated care system isn't just the integrated care board, the integrated care partnership. It's everybody who's a part of it. And so all those organisations, all those partners have got their own programmes that they're also doing as well. So the reach and the network through that reach is, is quite considerable. So I'm probably going to wrap up there um, and hand back for final comments to you, John, and I'll just quickly look at uh, the chat box um, while I do that and obviously take any live questions that come in. Thanks, Chris. I mean, that's all the, um, and that's the end of it. Um, just Peter's asked about what's different in terms of reaching out to minority groups. I think what's different is that we've learned from COVID that you have to actually deliver care if you're going to reach those groups in a way which is helpful to them. So I'll just give you one example. Um, there's a, a place not in this, um, Place, but we've done some things around homeless, etc. But this one's where, uh, for respiratory, there was about a DNA in outpatients of about 50%. And quite a lot of time was spent talking to that particular community about working out how we could communicate better. And those DNAs for outpatients is now less than 2%. So I think the big difference there is that uh, if we, we need to engage much more with communities, and we've really, COVID's taught us this, the vaccination program was a huge success, um, but that required us, particularly in the latter stages of that, to think much more carefully and to discuss with communities how we deliver the vaccination program to get people to be able to or to be willing to come forward. So that's just one example um, of how we deliver care in a way which suits individual communities in a in better than just a one size fits all. Um, 
Lenny, I'm going to hand back to you in case there are any other questions. Um, or Chris, anything you picked up from the yeah, chat so, box? Yeah, certainly. So really good example there, John, uh, for Peter's question about um, a, a sort of different approach. Now, it isn't, I mean, this is incumbent on all of us, and I think this is where the integrated care partnership, the ICS, will make the difference. So active partnership through local authorities, voluntary sector, uh, the different partners are already already there. So not recreating our own version of it through 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 the ICB, the NHS, but actually worked, working in what I call strategic intent, strategic partnership on this. And I think I think that's where I would look at for the value added straight away from the integrated care partnership. So so hopefully that gives some sense. There are a couple of questions I've got um, just going back up to um, Jeannie's question about the GP appointments. Yes, you are absolutely right. Um, there's a mixture of different appointments in though in, in there. Don't, let's forget. Let's remember though, vast majority of appointments are still GP appointments. They 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 still are. Although recognise um, uh, we've got nurse practitioner, uh, associates uh, practitioners. There's a, there's a whole cadre in in the general practice team that will qualify as, as GP appointments and access that make those figures. But we will we'll certainly uh, some are included, some some aren't, uh, depending on on the type of of care requirement there. So uh, you're you're right, Jeannie, to point out there's there's a whole cadre of people who work in the general practice teams. Uh, in terms of comments, I think it was uh, from Tony about uh, the COVID jab, the flu jab uh, together. Well, we, we still remain under guidance from uh, the JCVI about the, the, the rollout of the programme. You'll remember um, from previous time about um, trying to do the two at the same time at the same appointment that didn't materialize previously due to logistics of of the program um, but we'll wait further guidance on there in you know in terms of um in terms of how we how we work on that going forward i think um uh we know don't we because we ran the pro the two programs together uh, that we did well on both we did well on running the COVID programme and the flu programme. More to do, of course we do, more to do. We want, every, we want to increase it all the time, but we, we did well on, on both of those. I think that's the way it'll be in, in this autumn programme is, is my instinct, but uh, I'll await the, the formal guidance on, on that. Um, just picking up a comment, I think I, think I saw it um, uh, from Chris about uh, social care and how the ICS will support this yeah really important question there it's 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 of fundal, fundamental importance to me i spend a lot of time working with local authority colleagues about um you know community care the requirements for community care both in the nhs and and through social care uh the challenges to uh the packages of care that that our local authorities can deliver versus um that resource, that resource gap that I was talking about on the NHS side, that's equally true, um, you know, and I'm sure local authority colleagues would be describing it in that way if they, they were on the call with me about they've got a version of that in terms of resource and the demands for care and, and the resources available. In terms of what we do about it, we, um, we firstly, we understand it. We understand the relative positions of the NHS local authorities. That's really important. Um, we work collaboratively on it because it's a key agenda to both parties um, and we, we, we commit to working through it as jointly. We are working through a programme now and it's not just about um, discharge from hospital, it's not just about that, it's about the, the total care requirements. We're working through how we support local authorities uh, particularly if we think about the difference between county and city in terms of the availability of, of what we call domiciliary care and what we can do as an NHS to support that um, because you're right one of our biggest challenges uh, as, as, as a health and care system is, is that the availability of domiciliary care in people's own homes and that's one of the big things that we were, were focusing on together. I, I work 
you know, I take it incredibly seriously and I work with local authority leaders on this. Uh, and um, so hopefully that's that's how you can see that the ICS is is, is working on it. Um, and then Valerie's, yes, um, you're right. This is one of the differences of the Integrated Care Board, Valerie, in terms of the uh, people and culture agenda. The Integrated Care Board of the NHS does now have a statutory duty about the overall workforce position of the NHS. And so we, we've instigated through John's leadership a, a people and culture board across the whole NHS system. We're also working with local authorities on that too, about bringing that into the partnership and doing exactly what, what you've said there to see what can we do to support our staff that we have? What can we do to both uh, increase uh, our, our staffing numbers where we where we have vacancies, but also retain them. And so there's a whole programme of work going on across across the whole NHS and involving other partners about that, but also thinking about new new types of staff. Uh, how do we bridge the gap between health and care? How, how do we get a new cadre of care staff that sort of blur those boundaries and, and create a new a sort of new model really so hopefully that gives you some assurance um i don't have specific details around sharon's question around uh ukrainian uh migrants uh to hand but if we could lenny we will we'll pick uh that up I, I know there is a a you know we're part of a national program in terms of supporting uh migrants and obviously uh, the health needs of migrants so we, you know we will be playing our part i just don't have the specific details to hand uh, this afternoon for you but i certainly know that we are playing our part there and um yes and and i think i think valerie you've asked a real question about what's the value added what's the difference that the integrated care partnership can bring i think that's i think you hit the nail on the head I think this is now about working on those wider determinants of health as a partnership. So I think you are absolutely right. This isn't about the NHS trying to solve all of those. It's about working in partnership with those partners who, who do have an influence there. So hopefully I've given you some uh, reassurance there. And I think and I think that's there, John. I've done my best to to catch up there. OK, thank you. Um, there's one hand up and. Did you want to add anything before I hand back to Lenny to wrap it all up? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'm very worried. I'm the chair of Stubbley Medical. I get lots of phone calls from patients who attend the surgery. Uh, we're predominantly elderly in Drumfield. And I had a lady who contacted me who had a problem went to a &E, was then presented with uh, a tablet to fill out details. She'd never seen one in her life. Someone did go and help her, but the end result was she was told you'll have to go to Whitworth, which is 15 miles from Drumfield. Uh, so what she, she didn't go, so she didn't get any treatment. And then another lady rang me and said, the retinal screening which is available at Kalo isn't available anymore. And she said, I've got to go out of, in the back and beyond at, at Chesterfield. And I know because we went and did this journey to see what it was like. And um, again, you know, more and more services are moving away from Drumfield. And these two patients hadn't got relatives. Um, they hadn't got neighbours to ask. And they were on basic state pension. I think Anne. Um, 80 plus ladies are. So uh, I just wonder, are you going to do anything for the residents of Drumfield? And I think because of the specifics of this, we're going to need to come back to you and contact you and, and, and see mm. the particular issues here rather than discuss, because I'm certainly not fully cited on what you're saying. But also, I think it's as this is around individual patients, perhaps better to have this conversation offline. So we, we presumably got your contact mm. details there. So we'll get back to you and follow it up outside of this. Is that OK? 
Um, I'm also conscious of time, which we've now run out. So, um, Lenny, yeah. can I hand back to you yeah. and say thank you very much for everybody who attended. Lenny. You're on mute, Lenny, are you? Probably. I'm having much internet fun at the moment. Um, thank you very much to Chris and to uh, John for coming along and speaking to everyone. And I will drop you a message um, outside of this meeting so we can pick up on on um, and take that back and, and pick that up for you. Um, I think there are a couple of questions. I'll go through the chat as well and just identify any questions we may not have picked up. So so we make sure that we cover everything. But thank you very much to Chris and John um, for their time today and to you all for coming along to this Derbyshire se dialogue session. Um, the next one, we've got another one in August on the 25th of August. Um, which is around uh, post COVID, long COVID. Um, so please do book onto that. Um, if you've got any issues at all, please email us on the Derbyshire Dialogue email. Um, and uh, I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and we will see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.